uh, hand over to Levente, who is um, yeah, giving us, uh, us more insights on um, what is coming beyond Heimlich <coughs> So, Levente, thanks. Hey, hello everybody. My name is Zavita Mesach. I'm working for the, in the Omni Core Developer Team in Budapest. And uh, so my presentation, in this presentation, I'm giving you an overview of what's happening right now in INET, in the Core Developer Team. Uh, the first topic is more or less already done. The other two is on the to-do list. But of course, there are many other topics that we are thinking of. Uh, it's more uh, about infrastructure. It's not that interesting in terms of, like you know, running Omnet on a supercomputer or detecting UV or uh, photons or three D visualization. But anyway, um, okay. This figure is just a short reminder that uh, in the real world, applications often use not just transport layer but uh, network layer and link layer protocols, and then they don't just sit on top of the transport layer. And, and this, this is important in light of the next slide, which shows the current, current node, network node architecture. This is a simplified model, just to, to show that uh, right now we have separate submodules for different kinds of applications, like TCP, UDP, ping, and tune applications, which is uh, kind of weird, because what if an application wants to use TCP and UDP simultaneously? That's kind of not directly perhaps possible. You could derive from the base modules and you know write your own yeah. nodes. <coughs> that seems very inconvenient in, because that's not what we want as a, as, as a feature of INET. Uh, but more than that, if you look at, for example, the tune applications, it's kind of weird because it's right, right now it only connects to the inter tune interface, which means it's quite useless because it can only do an echo or something like that. It doesn't connect to any real protocol. And the question arises that which protocol should it connect to? Should it connect to TCP, UDP, IPv, or for all of them, or what? And there's this other problem. If we want to introduce IPv6 into the picture, then we suddenly need some kind of dispatch mechanism towards the natural protocols from both the transfer protocols and the link layers, because now we have two different kinds of natural protocols. So in general, between the OCI layers, there are many to many relationships which are not right kind of right now which are not really represented. If you look at the TCP application, uh, currently it's exclusive and directly connected to TCP and the, the red arrow here displays the, the way the packets travel through the host. And in the downward downward direction there's no dispatch involved, so the application simply sends to TCP and TCP sends to IP4 and that's all. But in the upward direction, IPv4 has to dispatch between the transport protocols, and also TCP has to dispatch between the applications. That's important. The, these dispatch mechanisms are built into these components. The UDP is pretty much the same, so it's, there's some kind of redundancy here, because it's the same kind of dispatch mechanism. The more weird as a thing regarding this is that Network layers actually have separate gates for ping applications, which is kind of weird because it's not how real 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 world looks. And more than that, IPv4 needs to do some special ICMP packet handling to just to be able to to forward the packets to the ping applications. Uh, so we come to this new network uh, architecture that we are thinking of. We introduced this these uh, dispatcher modules here between the layers, and we eliminated the uh, dispatch mechanisms from the individual protocols, and replaced the specific uh, application submodules with a single application submodule, and also replaced the vector gates with sim simple scalar gates. This, uh, this new architecture needs some, some way to find out where protocols actually are, so we have to we introduce this protocol registration mechanism, so the protocols need to register themselves in the initialized via C++ calls. 
and the dispatchers learn where they are in the in the architecture, learn learn which gates they are connected to, and they also forward this registration towards modules <coughs> further down the road so that they can also learn where the protocols are. Um, interfaces also have to register themselves in the dispatcher, so this registration is pretty simple. You just provide an ID, which is a completely artificial ID. It's just a name and an integer that uniquely identifies the protocol itself with version and that thing. But it's just a simple artificial ID. So the dispatchers learn, learn this information, and based on that, I'll show you later, they can do, do their work. But uh, dispatchers are optional, they are not at all mandatory. So there are, there are other ways to, to build nodes. For example, this simple node structure with one application, one transport protocol, and one network data protocol, and one interface is possible. But if you have several applications, then you need a dispatcher. If you have several interfaces, then you need a dispatcher too. Interestingly enough, the IPv4 network layer is a compound module itself, and dispatchers can be reused there because they are quite protocol agnostic in, in a way they are pretty much independent where they are used. And uh, this also allows us to, to remove <coughs> special code from the IP network layer uh, regarding the ICMP packets <coughs> forward. So this figure shows how a TCP application communicates in the new, the new infrastructure. The C++, C++ code didn't change, so it's still the same, same thing. The TCP socket, the API is the same. Nothing has changed regarding the application this way. Sockets are, in the same way, dynamically created and destroyed. Dispatchers learn where the sockets are based on, based on looking at the socket open and close, close commands, and they they uh, forward the packets based on that information that they learn. Uh, UDP is pretty much the same, but if you look, look between UDP and IPv4, what happens there is, is the, the packet is routed by the dispatcher based on the destination protocol, which, which is able to handle the, the packet. And the destination protocol is just determined from the control info and, and, the, and the packet class itself. So the protocol is identified again with a very simple artificial unique identifier, so it's not, not, not really complicated. <coughs> With the new infrastructure, ping applications are just simple applications. They, they just open an IPv4 row socket and send ICMP echo requests. And the request goes this direction. It goes directly to IPv4. There's no special gate needed in the network protocol. It's just it, le it works pretty much the same way as it works in the real world. Uh, but it's also possible to, to use an Ethernet socket from an application directly communicate via Ethernet, because the Ethernet interfaces also registers them themselves, so it's pretty much possible. And there was this problem in the previous architecture that monet routers uh, couldn't share the same uh, net type because uh, monad protocols were different in terms of what kind of uh, protocol they use. You, do they use UDB or IPv4 or what? <coughs> it wasn't clear where to put them, so it, it, we couldn't have a general, general architecture. And that's why I really had to introduce the network node in the, in the wireless examples so that we can replace the node. But this way it's, it's possible because I could even do it in a way that, that there's no separate routing uh, application vector here, just a routing application is just one application of the several ones that is, that is running in, inside the node and it communicates in different route than the standard application. I just separated it just for showing it this way. Uh, and there's this tunnel application, which is an interesting application because uh, if you think of a real uh, tunnel application, it really has to do two things simultaneously. It has to open a TUN device, and it also has to open an IPv4 socket, raw socket, if it wants to dial IPv4 packets through IPv4. It could also do it via UDP, but I'm going to show you it uh, in a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, way how it works. So 
So if, for example, that application runs here, let's, see that, let's say that there's one application, and the uh, beginning of the tunnel receives a packet from the network, the IPv4 uh, module gets it, and based on the pre-configured uh, routing table, uh, to certain destinations, it will route the, the packet towards the tune interface here. And since the application opened the tune, tune device, it's going to get the packet from the interface via this, this direction. And then finally, the application simply sends the packet to, to the IPv4 using the row socket, and it's going to be encapsulated and, and uh, routed towards the end of the tunnel. And on the, on the other end of the tunnel, it's going to do the same thing in the reverse direction. So it's going to come in, and the IPv4 will decapsulate, and the application will get through this, to the row socket and then send to the tune interface. And from the tune interface, it's going to back to the IPv4 to, route it, to be routed again to the original destination. So in this way, we can have a real-time application. This is how it looks in the real world. This is one way to do it. We are not sure yet whether if this one is better. That's these blue boxes, or the, these uh, colored boxes, basically are just figures. That's the new Comsec and this uh, thin uh, blue line is the dispatcher. Sorry. Um, <coughs> one question with respect to the uh, um, previous slide. Uh, actually, two, two slides back. So could, could you use this to model um, stuff like MVGRE uh, kind of um, enca encapsulation approaches uh, like that where um, you virtualize uh, at, at, at layer two. So you, get, you go down to, to ethernet, um, but then actually enter like a virtual uh, a switch that then re-encapsulates into, into UDP uh, to find the actual uh, destination addresses. I, I'm because not sure if over, I I'm not sure if I understood what, what you want to do. So, um, yeah, so basically, with, with network virtualization, we're seeing uh, a recursion of, 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 of the, uh, the actual network stack. So when you get to the Ethernet, um, you're starting basically, well, not, not at the top, um, but basically at U UDP. Um, From here, you want to go back to here? Or yeah, or even one, uh, one level above. You want, you want to yes. encapsulate la layer two on layer top of two in, in layer uh, four. four. Ah, okay, I see. Um, we're seeing, but uh, via via special interface or or just a. So I was wondering when you, I guess you describe this, whether you can kind of go um, as long as it goes through the application. That's that's I think that's do it. That's doable. I mean, if if it goes through the application via tune interface, which is a virtual interface, because the, these are real interfaces. Yes. So it's, I don't think in the real, in the real life you can, can you configure a real interface to, to go back? Yeah, I mean, I they, they, they look like real interfaces, but actually it's a piece of software. Because you, you have a whole bunch okay, of VMs, but, okay, but in terms of modeling, these are real switch. interfaces. So in terms of modeling, this is the actual software, which is, which acts like them being an interface. Mm -hmm. So using this kind of interface, I think you can do that. Okay. Can I also, um, so p people do UDP encapsulation, so like running SCDP over UDP, can I do this with this dispatcher stuff and say um, the node gets a UDP packet so it goes up to the UDP stack and the SCDP transport layer has registered a particular port no UDP port number to receive this stuff. So it goes up to UDP uh -huh. via the destination protocol. UDP sees, oh, it's that particular port, and then it goes into the SCTP layer. Okay, that's a good question. I think we, we, we need to talk about it because it's not, not an easy easy answer. Because so it's what you're saying is that SCTP is also acts like a user of the UDP, UDP protocol, not just a... People encapsulate transport protocol or even also other protocols in UDP just to get through NETs. Okay. So you see IPsec over UDP, <coughs> you see... You can certainly do that. You can certainly do that, but you, you, you obviously need a different structure than the, than the standard host. It's not... It's not, not, in the, not in the standard host, I think. But, but probably uh, you can do that because the, if the SCTP 
layer itself registers also as an application, so it opens a UDP port. Then UDP socket. U UDP socket. Sorry, then it's possible. I think. Yeah, but did that. But you have to change the structure because the SCTP protocol has to be above also be able yeah. to. Then ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So probably need but not with this structure, but you can create a separate. And we also created separate. That's clear that you can put, this is how it's done in, 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 yeah. in real stacks. Basically, we didn't lose any functionality because the only, only, thing, only, only, the only thing that changed is that, that the dispatch manager went from A to B. I mean, it's, okay. uh, it's just where it is. So, and, and we also introduced a lot of base modules so that you can reuse the node structure like the most basic base module is. It just has it just has uh, you know battery mobility and stuff like that. And then we have a link layer based module, a network layer based module, a transport layer based module, application layer based module, which builds up the node. So if you want to use the any one of them and extend your own structure, it's a little bit trickier structure than it's doable, I think. <coughs> but at least we are going to make sure it's and it's easy. Uh, okay, let's switch to the next topic, which is uh, about cross-layer design, cross-layer communication optimization. It's not really a solution. I'm, I'm just trying to, to to show the problems, the issues. I'm trying to answer. <coughs> so, real protocols often use these cross-layer communications, like passing parameters down the layers or getting information uh, from lower layers. Uh, some notable examples are quality of service and uh, energy over routing or resource optimization algorithms. So it's quite well known. Uh, this, the current, currently we are not really, we, we don't really support it in the end. So we have some kind of plugin solutions like this one here. An EDP application wants to send out a uh, Back it on a certain interface, it has to provide interface ID within the UDP control info, which is kind of weird because are we going to put all kinds of lower layer uh, information into the UDP control info and all <coughs> other kinds of control infos or what? So it's not, not really, it's, it doesn't really mix in a well, good way. And currently, there are not even, it's not even possible to, to specify the type of service parameter to control quality of service functionality from the application because there's no way to communicate that through the transport layer. So we came up with this idea that, that packets would, would be extended with, with tags. Tags are just simple small C++ classes that contain some, some data. And uh, they can pass through layers, they can be updated, deleted, or changed in any way. And they are automatically copied in encapsulation when encapsulation happens or the decapsulation happens. And practically there are two kinds of text requests that are coming from top top down and indications that go from bottom up. And then the various components could use those texts for certain purposes. And here are a couple of examples that came to our mind. Uh, we're not sure whether if we want to really distinguish between requests and indications because most of them uh, could be used in both ways, but it's, it might turn out to be error prone if, if we don't distinguish between the two because very easily a packet can just turn around, for example, do regrouting, and then if you don't update the information, then we are going to uh, be in trouble. So this is rather it's not 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 a current solution. We are we are not yet done this, uh, but we are thinking of along the way. Uh, yeah, for this the the API ha has to be extended with, with with get tag and you know add tag, clip tag, remove tag, things like that. Uh, okay, that's for the. Uh, that's a question. Are you using those tags within uh, normal packets or there are special? No, it's normal packets. So it, should, it would be normal packets. Currently, it's not implemented. It's yeah. I'm I'm raising the question that had that uh, that uh, there is some problem because we don't support the cross-layer communication at all. Mm -hmm. 
and it would be really nice to have some kind of standard way of doing it. But I mean, those are, are not supposed to be data packets. Are just uh, I'm just if I no, know this is this these tags are added to the packet. Yes. So the packet holds the information, and as it goes down, it gets updated, deleted, changed, whatever. But the point is that the data goes with the packet, and as if the packet gets encapsulated, or encapsulated, or anything like that, the tags go with it. So it's mm -hmm. so that's in, in that way you yeah. can communicate. Through the, through the layers. And it's not like that, that protocol components can't just delete or ignore or update or anything attack if they want to. So this way, if, if you want to communicate the type of service from an application, you just put the tag there and it, the, the, the lower layer protocol will get it. Or if you want to base your routing decision on the reception power or whatever, you get the information from the physical layer in the, in the routing protocol. And it's an easy way to do it. The tags will be extensible, or Pardon? the tags will be extensible, or I mean, yes, you write certainly. that task, so certainly. which, which so. means for me in, in, in IP, I would say I can can set can the application can set the diff <coughs> point point, and it ends up there. So I also want the don't fragment bit. Yeah, yeah sure. And sure, okay. you could have your own text, or you could just extend no, no, the text. I mean, it's like y you will look through the IP you will look into the IP layer mm -hmm. and see what kind of tags we need. And yeah. Expose yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, these are just examples. I mean, okay. Sort of so, will there be a possibility to set the kind of default set of tags, which will be attached to the packet, similar to what the socket layers do these days? So that well, we set so I think it's reasonable to say to, to have some kind of utility functions that does this. I think it's reasonable. <coughs> so, the last topic is about refactoring some kind of refactoring of mobility models because we realize that some there are some issues but actually the goal is to make them more composable and support the upcoming 3D visualization. Uh, we already have mobility models for for static positioning like like a grid static positioning and there are mobility models that move nodes around but <coughs> we don't have means to combine those so it's it's either this or this. So there's, there's no way to combine those. So I think it's, it would be nice to be able to separate initial positioning from positioning over time, because that's two different thing, things. And there are also group mobility models, but I think the plural is not quite right, because we have only one, but anyway. But one can ask the question how to reuse existing models for group mobility, because it's nice that we have one group mobility, but why, why don't we just be able to reuse the, 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 the simple mobility models. For example, if you think of a ship docking, docking in a port on Google Earth, I mean, it's a real port, and uh, passengers are moving around on the ship, with their, 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 there's Wi-Fi, there's LTE, 3G, 4G, whatever, around the coast and things like that, so it's pretty complicated, but it would be desirable to, to be able to, to define the, the mobility of the ship separately from the mobility of the people, but both mobility affects the communication. So it's, the, it's a problem. Uh, and there are sometimes cases where, <coughs> for example, positioning and orientation are best expressed in separate mobility models. For example, satellites, the trajectory of satellites is, can be defined by separate mobility. Than, than the orientation, because they might communicate with each other, or ground stations, but which ground station, so whatever comes into your mind. Or for example, if a vehicle moves on the surface of the Earth, you certainly don't want to, to deal with the difficulty of the elevation, because it, it comes from the map, but the mobility is, you know, is just moving the, the vehicle around. So we came up with the mobility superposition, which is not that rapid science. It's just combining different positioning and orientation models. Using superposition, of course, you need some kind of limitations in time. And we could do to in this way that we would have a constant initial, post initial uh, positioning and some groove positioning that moves, for example, linear way and some cyclic move mobility for for an individual node and some perturbation and then the 
superposition looks like this. It's not fixed, I mean, it, uh, the set of different properties. You could just super tear the superposition of mobilities. That's, that would be one way to do it. This is, a, uh, this is, again, this is not yet implemented. It's just some kind of thinking that's where INET is going. <coughs> and then there's the coordinate system problem, because now that we have Google Earth, so in the past we were pretty much satisfied with the VDF coordinate system that you know, we had x, y, and z. But now we have Google Earth, and you, we, we, we have to know that this, what kind of coordinate is it, and how to, how to visualize it. And also, there are more complicated cases. What if, what if you want to express the position of, of some people inside a building? Do you really want to, to provide the VGS 48 coordinates for the people? I guess no. Because they, the building is somewhere in the city, but the people in the building is much easier to express via abstract coordinate systems. And the same thing would be said of a vehicle that goes around the city and there's an antenna on top of the vehicle and the antenna just, antenna orientation is obviously not, has nothing to do with the vehicle mobility. I mean, it's, there's some position and somehow it decides where to move and that's all. So it's again separate mobility. So I think that was all I have. Thank you for your kind of attention. Are there more questions? There seems to be a little bit of overlap now between control info and tags. Um, you are absolutely would right. Would it be possible to fold one into the other? You are absolutely right. We were thinking along the lines whether the control infos are needed at all, but I'm not sure. I think we should talk about that because it's not an easy. So if it would be easy to answer, then we would probably come up with an answer already. So I don't know. But it's not it's not it's not exactly control enforced because in this this that the text allows you to independently attach data to the packets. So the source <coughs> of the data, the sources of the data don't have to worry about other sources of the data. So if there's only one control info, then you have a problem because then you end up with the UDP control info. Everything is put into one control info, which is kind of weird because then we could really end up with one control info object and there would be lots of comments that when you said this one, then you don't said this one or so, you know, it's, it's not, not that good. So, yeah. If I recall correctly, in NS3, they had a, a, some kind of tagging mechanism where the tags were attached to certain range, byte ranges in the packet. So, so if I if I recall that if I recall the strategy, so that you you'd have tags that were associated with um, parts of the header. So you have a, a tags that could be associated with the Mac header or the UDP header or the application header. How I, I, I guess I'm still looking. How does this? How does how do, how do you see the tags um, relating, say, to packet encapsulation or or is it is it something that's attached to, to the packet and as the packet's encapsulated, all of the tags are visible? Yes, I think the encapsulation man is right now in the current, impl current implementation just copies the text, so it's the text just survived the encapsulation. Mm -hmm. But if if you could, if you think about having the same tag, uh, specific same kind of text, specifying different data for different parts of the packets, if it's really needed, then it's. I I don't I don't I don't know. I was just I was just curious what you thought because my, my recollection is that. Is yeah, that is that NS, NS3 kind of attach them to parts of the packets and then as you decapsulate yes, and encapsulate things things appeared and disappeared in strange ways and yeah okay, um, okay. But, so I'm just curious if you had some thoughts about how the encapsulation no. or if it's just all of them are accumulated onto the packet accumulated are, visit, uh, are visible to all visible to all but it's possible to delete it so I mean if one the protocol company just decides to ignore the MAC address request, which is to fake some kind of MAC address, then it's up to the whatever component. I mean, it's just a request. It's just one comment. If you're thinking about tunneling, then we have like two IPv4 headers in the same packet. Yeah. And it would be possible to, to grab the tags which belong to, to one of the IPv4 no, into other tags, so like wrap them up and put them together. So, so we could still have all of them. All of them. Mm -hmm. But like the, the inner one would be a little bit more difficult to, to access, to access. still be there. Okay. 
So the point is, it's, it's possible to, okay. to preserve all the text and not confuse them. No, 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 no. <laughs> so, so they're both, they're both properly yes. calculated and visible. Yes. Okay. <coughs> oh. I think a mobility and position is two different things. So we have like, we used to have a grid layout of the mobility. I don't think that's mobility. I think that is just that's positions. Relative yeah, to but positions. yeah, that's, that's that's kind of right. But in INET, oh, no, you're saying in INET, right? Yeah, in INET, INET modeling, unfortunately, we we model the initial position also with the mobility. Right. So it's kind of weird because then then we end up not being able to fix those. A lot of, a lot of game engines will basically say I have, a, I have an object that is you know, part of some kind of a composition. And I am merely a transformation from some other in relation to some other thing. How I move is has nothing to do with where I'm at. It's completely two different concepts. And then, but then you make when you ask where are you at in, in a, a larger coordinate system, lots of transformations take place to figure out here's where I'm at in say GWS eighty four. Yeah, that's right. That's or WGS eighty four. I see what you're saying. So I don't know if there's some angle to because mobility, I think of as movement. Yeah, that's right. Not necessarily like an aircraft has a certain mobility when it flies and performance that has nothing to do with where it's at. Yeah, but in a certain way, not moving at all is a mobility too. So it's <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. It's right. very special mobility, but anyway. right, right. But that's just a position. I just think <coughs> about changing my position. Maybe if you split it up yeah, like this, you have. Uh, if you want to combine static and uh, mobile nodes in one scenario, those, those mobile nodes would have a mobility of zero, a movement of zero, and a certain position. And there are usually people coming up with questions like, oh, what was my current position? What are the last five positions in that time frame? Something like this. Mm -hmm. So the superposition solves some problems, but I think... No, not at all. Mm, no, not at all, but um, it also gets some other problems. and Like the splitting up of... I can just put him this node in a position and I yeah, give him some movement, some mobility, or I don't give him any movement or mobility at all. So it just stays there. Thick static like we have now, static mobility, which isn't yeah. like mobility, it's just like position. But this would be possible just like today. I mean, I wouldn't, I don't think that it's it's going to be lost or something. Mm, no, not lost. I mean, but when you think about refactoring or re, uh, reinventing the mobility. Well, we, yeah. Okay, I see what you're, what yeah. you're saying, but there's maybe ways to make it I, I'm not saying that you're going to completely change everything because mm. unless it's really justified. <laughs> so but there may be ways so to make we want to easier, keep yeah. simple things simple mm. and complicated things possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that's why like if you want to combine mobile and non-mobile modes in one scenario, which isn't easily possible now. Yeah. The easiest way now is to have like a mobile scenario and then make them move make don't make them move at all. So that's how I do like static and mobile nodes at the moment. And this would be easy, like just give them a position and no mobile, and the others have a position which they clearly need at the beginning of the simulation. Yeah. And some mobility trajectory. Okay, so what's the general, um, there's some time frame that you're thinking, are these uh, consequent steps that First, the, uh, the well, for node dispatchers, and then the I wouldn't say time frame because there are lots of other things on the table. Of course. So it's <laughs> like you know, I picked a couple of them, and yeah. which I think are important to mention here, mm -hmm. and, and I guess it depends. <laughs> so well, you probably want some of. But if from you the want to, 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 uh, to contribute, yeah. and we are happy to receive any comments and any suggestions, and mm -hmm. before we are going, we are actually doing something because they. Exactly. So we don't want to, to make your life harder, we want to make it easier. <laughs> so we can post on uh, the INET developer list or somewhere else uh, a number of things that you think about and then... Yeah, that's a gr good idea. Yeah, yeah. We are going to... So we can give you comments before you yeah, yeah. think and not too late or not too, yeah, like the not too early. Comment, yeah, like the yeah. infrastructure. But I think it's also a point that we can discuss later in the beyond yeah, the panel. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if you have more continue. questions, keep them in mind. We have the discussion afterward. Yeah. And uh, let's thank uh, you again.